Once again, we would like to invite our next speaker, Professor Hang Chang Chie, Executive Director at the Institute for Engineering Leadership and Professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Department of Industrial Systems Engineering and Management. He will be sharing about disruptive innovation theory and presenting his method on how such opportunities may be identified. Professor Hang, please. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to share with you what I know about disruptive innovations. Um, today, I will be focusing on opportunities for disruptive innovation. But uh, to get it started, I would first like to share with you what is disruptive innovation, because this term has been very loosely used, and uh, we have to use it in the right context, especially uh, when you want to identify opportunities. Uh, good innovative firms understand the principles of uh, innovation. You always need to uh, apply new technologies to replace the old ones. So when transistor was first invented, the vacuum tube uh, manufacturers saw the threat and thought that uh, they should master the new technology. So they invested a lot into R&D to try to see how transistor could uh, change their products. And as we know today, transistor has brought in the IT world. Uh, today, the modern world cannot live without transistor-related uh, innovation. And same thing happened when the uh, flat panel display came along. Um, it had the potential to replace the bulky TV tubes. And mobile phone. All of us cannot live without mobile phone. You know? uh, replacing landline phones, and so on. Yet, when you really look at the innovation, um, you would have thought that all these uh, good and innovative companies that invested a lot into R&D would survive. Not always. So um, the dilemma is that uh, while they focus on trying to uh, overcome this threat, but when they are attacked by new entrant firms using certain technologies, all these uh, technologies that I have mentioned, had the characteristics that initially they were inferior. And uh, therefore, it caused certain problems that I will highlight in a moment. Uh, these technologies have been coined disruptive technologies. And um, the famous book by Professor Clayton Christensen has sold more than half a million copies. Um, it, the, the title of the book is very interesting. It's called Innovator's Dilemma. What it meant is that uh, all these companies are not sleeping. In fact, they invested tremendously uh, into the new technologies, but they failed uh, in the transition. So it will be interesting for us to uh, take a look at the first example of Transistor. And uh, along the way, we will discuss the opportunities uh, associated with it. Professor Christensen has um, taught us that uh, innovations or technologies you could classify into sustaining or disruptive. When he talked about sustaining, it meant that uh, Established companies always try to improve their product performance. So every year you look at the new products uh, being introduced to enhance the whatever being replaced. This is called sustaining technologies. Uh, it could be incremental or it could be radical ones. So it should be, uh, you, it is very important for us to differentiate when, because when we talk about disruptive, it's discontinuous. But uh, many times, it could be radical. So the strategies could be very different. But occasionally, disruptive technologies emerge. Uh, please remember the term occasionally, because at the end, I will come back to this. Um, Disruptive technologies have not been systematically cultivated or, or created. It, it came by itself. And um, um, so 
you cannot say that uh, next two years I'm going to create two disruptive technologies. Uh, uh, it, it did not come that way. Uh, especially so when, when you uh, look at it from the characteristics. This kind of disruptive technology actually resulted in worse product performance, at least in the near term. Hence, they underperform established products. It means that the vacuum tube uh, manufacturers tried to apply transistor to their products and found that it could not be compared, so they could not be uh, pushed out to the market. However, they are good enough with certain features that a few fringe and new customers would value. They're typically cheaper, simpler, smaller, and frequently more convenient to use. Um, Professor Christensen also uh, helped us to understand that uh, disruptive innovation comes in two forms, either at the low end of an existing market. For example, digital camera. There are already camera in the market, uh, display, LCD versus the conventional. So this is called low-end disruptive innovation. And we also have new market uh, uh, disruption, meaning that the home-based radio, you enjoy your hi-fi, your computers, and whatever um, home-based uh, tabletop uh, devices. Someone, now, someone come out with a portable, uh, with a battery-powered, for example, the first-generation pocket radios. Uh, their performance are not as good as the home-based radio. But how come it becomes a new innovation? Um, I will go through the commercialization of transistor to demonstrate how an incumbent uh, would treat such an invention and uh, frame it as a uh, sustaining innovation. And uh, Transistor took many years before it became uh, usable by the incumbent. So here is the performance versus time. So the time scale from here to here, you are talking about 20 to 30 years. Uh, the time scale here uh, is logarithm. So what it means is this, while you see this line is uh, not very steep, but actually, from here to here, there are very several generations of uh, technological innovation. Uh, this is the red line shows what the customer can uh, uh, are satisfied with. And uh, because of competition, originally, uh, the performance of many new products are not as good as what the customer wanted. But after a while, uh, it satisfied what the uh, mainstream market needed, and very quickly it exceeded. So examples will be your cars. Uh, they are designed to run at 120, 150 kilometers per hour, but your speed limit is 70, 90. But all these are performance overshoot. So established markets for the vacuum tube uh, manufacturers, they are dealing with tabletop radios, television, computers, and so on. Uh, when they did the R&D to uh, try to make transistor better, they found that it took too long. After five years, 10 years, no products coming out. Um, actually, uh, from historical record, from here to here, to replace uh, one of these, it will take 20 to 25 years. So no product coming out. Um, if there was no entrance, no new startups, they were lucky, uh, but real life is not like that. Uh, you will find that entrepreneurs would use it uh, initially in hearing aids. Now, this is a no-brainer because uh, you want something smaller, cold, vacuum tubes cannot go to your ears, so hearing aids straight away. But what else? Here, uh, we found that companies like Sony We've introduced the first pocket radio. And as the performance improved with time, it, go, it went into others. 
portable TVs. And along the line here, there are something like 10 to 15 uh, disruptive innovations, including the famous Walkman. So um, while the incumbents, the vacuum tube manufacturers struggle with this, and after five years, 10 years, their R&D had to be closed down because they, they couldn't produce uh, products. Whereas a new entrants like Sony came up with all these new ones, getting more and more profit, plow back to R&D, and eventually, uh, oh, before that, uh, I should say that uh, these are the new markets that the incumbents, they were focusing on their existing products, so they, they couldn't launch all this because these are new type of markets, and therefore, along this line, is called disruptive innovation. Uh, but given enough time, the performance of the new technology has reached a stage to satisfy this red curve. This is where disruption occurs. Disruption occurs because these are uh, good enough products, and yet, in the meantime, uh, the incumbents' product already suffered a performance overshoot. So these are uh, fairly, in a very short time, they switch over to all these new uh, products. Now, you may, at this stage, feel that transistor is old story. Um, how about uh, current? Uh, today, uh, when we talk about future disruption, uh, the next slides, I will switch over to electric vehicle. So imagine that uh, instead of a vacuum tube, you are talking about all the uh, car makers, Toyota, Mercedes, BMW, and all the uh, four-wheeler uh, makers, versus newcomers that come out and launch new uh, uh, electric vehicles, uh, which I will introduce uh, in, a mo in a moment. So the ongoing example is EV. Uh, just like the vacuum tube uh, makers, when they saw a transistor, they frame it as a threat, and therefore they put R&D to try to replace their vacuum tube by transistors in their existing products. So all the car companies did the same thing. I have a four wheelers, I have a Volkswagen, I have a Toyota, it's an internal combustion engine. I know that one day it has to be replaced by electric motor. So put electric motor in, but the performance is not as good. It's more expensive. So uh, the same story here, that uh, they frame it as a sustaining innovation. And very soon they found that it is a kind of radical innovation because after five years, 10 years, 20 years, they still cannot uh, beat the internal combustion engine. So for the electric motor to replace the IC engine until today, already 50 years, less than 5%, in fact, it's only like 1 or 2% of the world market is electric, maybe 4 to 5% uh, of a hybrid. But the um, sustaining radical innovation until today has not succeeded. Um, I will not uh, compare the case today because uh, by using Tesla, because Tesla is an exception. It's a kind of a disruption, but uh, it's not the kind that uh, I'm trying to uh, share with you today. So um, during question and answer, if you still want me to talk about Tesla, we can talk about it. Uh, but when you look at the equivalent of disruption here, uh, it did not come from the Western advanced countries. Uh, it actually happened in Asia. Uh, we saw that some of the Chinese entrepreneurs, instead of just focusing on four wheelers, some of them switched to electric bicycles and electric scooters. They put motors on the, on the bikes and tried to create new products. And of course, these were initially inferior compared to the gasoline motorbikes. But because they have good enough performance for certain class of uh, uh, consumers, and they are affordable, it appeal to farmers, people in the villages, 
smaller town in smaller towns and so on. And guess what? Huge success. You, you can see uh, the kind of uh, electric cycle, uh, electric scooters here. They're lightweight, affordable, have attracted new customers. Um, conventional motorbike uh, consumers with their macho motorbike will not use this. Who will be using it? From statistics, you can see that 80% of the customers were females because the motorbikes are too heavy for them. Uh, children, uh, parents who want to, uh, do, do not want their, their children to be killed by high-speed motorbikes on the roads. So this is much safer for them to go to school and so on. Older folks found that uh, gasoline motorbikes are too heavy, too, too bulky for them. And new applications, all the delivery people like it. Uh, Alibaba use a lot of this for delivery. So um, you have to start, stop, uh, you have to go into town and so on. So these smaller vehicles uh, created new uh, usage. And the new market created is actually very big. Uh, so in the first few years, people don't bother about you know, how to compete with the established markets because all these are new usage. Now, uh, the next slide, I'm going to share with you something that came out from our own research. Uh, when you, in future, uh, do courses with us in NUS, uh, we will be giving you something uh, uh, coming out fresh from our own uh, research in technology management, for example. Uh, before that, uh, as I mentioned, this new market is huge and has extremely high growth. So this is the charge that we have generated. Um, it, focus on this black one is the motorbike, conventional motorbike. And the orange one is the e-bike. Uh, ignore the blue one, which is bicycle. So you, when you compare this with this, so initially, when e-bikes were introduced in the market, the motorbike people just ignore them because uh, their sales continue to improve. So this looks like uh, something uh, fringe, something new. But uh, look at the curve here. Uh, when we first studied this, um, we started our research here. A lot of people told us that uh, e-bikes, uh, it may come and go. It will not be sustainable and um, there's no threat to the motorbike. So this was not a disruption. Until about here, uh, when we collected the data, it was like four or five years uh, uh, lag. So when we were around here, when we started to see this, starting to eat into the market share of motorbike. And the electric bike, as you can see, today is like a 30, 35 uh, million annual sales. And uh, so at this stage, the e-bikes have successfully uh, disrupted motorbike. And uh, of course, the motorbike people who try to do e-bikes now is too late because all these are um, selling in the millions. So that it already created very formidable e-bikes uh, competitors. What they are doing now is to really take the technology, because the technology is actually good enough to replace motorbikes. Uh, there are already two Singapore companies doing it. So over the next few years, you will see uh, the e-bike uh, technology, the motors, controllers, they are big enough, strong enough, they will go into uh, conventional motorbikes and then uh, say we can say goodbye to gasoline motorbikes. Um, so this is a new uh, disruptive innovation uh, that we see today from Asia. Now with this uh, understanding of what is disruptive, what is uh, um, uh, incumbent uh, facing this, uh, we, can, we can now uh, really come back to really look at what is opportunity. So opportunities, um, Instead of uh, going back to Clayton Christensen's book, uh, here the academics have um, told us that uh, 
innovation opportunity could either be discovered or create, created. And therefore, the strategies will be very different. So when you really look at the nature of opportunities uh, for the discovery, uh, you would um, know that opportunities in this case exist, either in the low end or in some underserved uh, market segment. And uh, the people involved here will be technical experts. They know what it is. And uh, they have a lot of industrial experience. And they will know how to address this opportunity. And the risk could be calculated because this is a known market. It's a matter of uh, introducing more products uh, at, the, at the low end of the industry. Uh, when we're talking about opportunity creation, it's a totally different uh, attempt. Here, you're talking about opportunities lie in the latent market. Uh, you, if you conduct a market survey, you will not find it. So when mobile phone, phone was first launched, uh, the market survey um, said there was no market. And the same thing when Steve Jobs introduced a smartphone. He never did any market survey because he already knew the answer. The answer will be there was no market. That was the reason why Nokia never bothered because there was no, it was latent. You wanted it, but you do not know. But the entrepreneurs are the one who experiment, uh, shift goals if necessary, and try to create changes. And here, the potential of a new market is very uncertain. And you need uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, either individual entrepreneurs in the startups or corporate entrepreneurs in large companies to be able to introduce this. So uh, in terms of innovation opportunity, whether it was discovered or created, um, we now know that uh, both are important. Uh, but the discovery approach is used more in the low end and the creation context will be needed in the new market creation. Um, this is my last slide. I want to uh, stay a little bit longer here uh, so that uh, uh, you can ask questions. Uh, for understanding the ent entrepreneurial opportunities, uh, we have just um, mentioned that uh, both discovery and creative creation strategies can be used, but the former, the discovery, will be used more frequently in low-end disruption, whereas the creation uh, approach will have to be used in a new market disruptive innovation. Um, so this is the principle. Uh, uh, we can talk about discovery and creation. Each of these will uh, be one or two days of uh, lectures uh, to tell you more about it. Uh, within the next few minutes, what I can share with you are three things that I'd like to uh, talk about uh, identifying opportunity for disruptive innovation. First one is that it should be a market pool strategy. So if you uh, insist on technology push, meaning that you find a technology, you try to look for a market for the particular technology. That is maybe good for incremental or good for um, uh, radical, suitable for radical. But for disruptive innovation, uh, it is better that you leverage on whatever is already available and you focus on how it can be used to satisfy the market. And uh, when I say disruptive technology is readily available, uh, I can mention that, in fact, all digital technologies are disruptive. Digital, when you compare to the old analog, digital is always inferior. Be it camera, be it whatever. Um, so um, new things such as uh, artificial intelligence, they are disruptive. They can only do certain things. Uh, human intelligence is much uh, higher than uh, AI, uh, probably for the next 10, 20, 50 years. So th these are uh, technologies 
that are already available, not very good, but you can always find opportunities to try to link that to a good market. Uh, next, I would want to, especially for Singapore, and uh, we are in uh, South, Southeast Asia in ASEAN, uh, you will find that there will be a lot, uh, many new um, needs in the middle class consumers in uh, emerging markets. So China, there are many innovations of this kind. India are now following China to introduce uh, uh, innovation, disruptive innovations uh, for the middle class. And we can also see that there are tremendous opportunities in ASEAN, Africa, and so on. So electric bikes, the examples that I have shown, is one example. Started from China, now going to India. So these are low speed electric vehicles. No need to have charging stations. Readily available, affordable. Many two wheelers, three wheelers in ASEAN countries, they are waiting to be disrupted. So uh, if you ask me uh, whether there's a tremendous opportunities, I would say yes. Both the motors, the controllers, and also the batteries. And uh, after doing the, all these things, Africa, South America will be your export market. So you, you will do this not because you want to conquer Silicon Valley or trying to uh, get your products into very advanced countries. You are talking about, so here you are talking about middle class consumers who will appreciate good enough uh, disruptive technologies. Lastly, uh, I mentioned, uh, remember, disruptive technologies emerge. Uh, it come out from, uh, uh, it only happens occasionally. Uh, no one knew when transistor was uh, invented. It was out of curiosity. Um, today, when you're really looking at uh, AI, um, it's, it tried to happen many times, but uh, it did not happen. Today, uh, it happened. Uh, there will be uh, new technologies like graphene, new materials. Uh, it also reminds me to tell you that transistors, AI, and uh, graphene, not the new materials, they are neutral. They can be used for radical innovation or they can be used for disruptive. Okay? It's up to the entrepreneurs, it's up to us to frame it and uh, uh, marry it with a proper applications and uh, business model to make it disruptive. But we should not be happy with just occasional. As engineers, we would like to see that in future, more and more disruptives could be created on purpose because there are many failures in the lab. It's not as good as you thought, but it's good enough to be applied somewhere. But right now, most R&D lab will just throw things away. So, uh, when you really look at the microprocessors used in your mobile phone, they, the original microprocessors were not good enough for PC. So uh, engineers in Intel just ignore it. But engineers in ARM, a UK company, continue to uh, leverage on its low power, small enough, low cost, and talk to a small company called Nokia and then launch the first generation mobile phone. So uh, there are already cases of um, entrepreneurs creating disruptive technologies on purpose. Um, many of our colleagues in this campus are starting to really look at some of the disruptive technologies that we could create on purpose. Um, one example is in batteries. Batteries, as we know, uh, we have lithium batteries used in your mobile phone and so on. But when you're talking about electric vehicles, lithium is there, too expensive. Lead acid was old-fashioned. Is there something in between? So some of the R&D in our laboratories will be adapted to find a gap and an opportunity that we can create disruptive technologies for future use. Um, this is uh, where I want to stop and ask you whether you have any questions. I think we have uh, 
10 minutes uh, for Q&A. Thank you. OK, I have on my screen the first question. How do we differentiate radical sustaining technology from disruptive technology? Radical sustaining technology usually takes much longer. And um, th like the electric motors that is suitable for four-wheelers already taken 50 years. Whereas if you really look at the electric motor for E2-wheelers, only like three or four years, uh, what the Chinese engineers did was to take the brushes DC motor, put it into the two-wheelers, and try to see whether it satisfied the needs in terms of speed, in, instead of a uh, four-wheeler, you have to design the motor to give you a, a vehicle speed of uh, 120, 150 kilometers per hour. Here, you are fairly happy with 20, 25 kilometers per hour. And um, the batteries, um, much uh, a, a small battery will do the job of uh, being charged and used for one or two days. Whereas the same battery that go into an EV uh, will take uh, many more years of um, R&D to create uh, a good price performance perf uh, and uh, enough um, uh, energy storage for two to three days. So uh, you use uh, lithium uh, for that. So electric motors for disruptive technology is already available, but the incumbents would want to uh, have something comparable to the electric vehicles. And therefore, you will have to wait until uh, Elon Musk uh, launched Tesla because he has plenty of money and he doesn't need a board uh, this, uh, decision. Uh, he went ahead and, and jumped uh, into uh, building a radical kind of a technology for E2 healers. So in terms of uh, cost of R&D, in terms of the length, in terms of the performance needed, there is a big difference between radical versus uh, disruptive innovation. Uh, what about Tesla? Is Tesla a disruptive innovation and how should companies like Toyota, General Motors respond to Tesla? Uh, when we describe disruptive innovation according to Clayton Christensen's theory, either from a low end or a new market, um, when it was when such a disruptive innovation is introduced back into the mass market, usually it starts from the lower end, then the middle end and the higher end. Tesla was completely opposite. When Tesla was first launched, Model X was for sports car. But it is disruptive in certain sense. Uh, it will tell the end users, you can have a Ferrari but at half the price. Wow. Then Model S, you can have uh, performance better than Mercedes S-Class, but at this price, maybe 20-30% cheaper. Then now Model Three. Now it will go into the high end of Toyota and, and so on. So you can have uh, uh, four wheelers now of comparable performance, but uh, in terms of the performance, uh, better from zero to 100. Uh, for the same price, uh, you buy a conventional gasoline uh, cars. Uh, it will go um, 0 to 100 in maybe 9 seconds. Here, you can have it 6 seconds. So it introduced actually better performance. But uh, it does not satisfy strictly the definition of a Clayton Christensen's theory. But it is a new kind of a hybrid innovation that has the combination of radical innovation and disruptive innovation. So Tesla is an exception. That's, therefore, Tesla caught all the big companies by surprise. OK, I think uh, 
You have one more question? Okay, good. Can you comment a little on AI opportunities or the potential major trend in view of 5G feasibilities in very nature? Um, AI is real. I got a call from uh, some of my ex-students and uh, colleagues uh, from uh, US, from Canada, asking me whether AI was real because they knew that I had done quite a lot of uh, research on neural networks 20, 30 years ago, and it failed at that time. But today, uh, AI opportunities is here. Microprocessors, low cost, but very, very powerful. And now we even have deep learning. We have a lot of research that uh, could already allow AI to be used in um, fairly uh, broad area of uh, applications. And um, so uh, when you really look at these AI opportunities, don't expect too much that it will be like a humanoid uh, can do a lot of these things. But if you really look at specific tasks, AI is very good at replacing repetitive tasks. So uh, there, there is uh, already uh, understanding that uh, many lawyers' jobs will be replaced by uh, AI algorithm. Because when you are already looking at um, uh, repetitive jobs, uh, AI can already do it. And uh, diagnostics, um, again, reading x-ray, reading uh, uh, images from medical images, many of these could already be replaced by AI. And uh, so I would encourage you to take a market uh, pool approach. Look at whatever areas you want to innovate and ask whether AI can do what. So when AI can do certain jobs, uh, launch it. And uh, it will take another 20 to 30 years when some of the more fanciful uh, uh, AI jobs uh, that uh, you saw in some movies and so on uh, will be realized. You have one more? OK. How do we look for all the potential disruptive technology? OK, I'll hear a little bit of uh, advertisement. Uh, many technologies are available in universities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, technologies themselves are neutral. How do you make it, uh, uh, frame it as a disruptive opportunity will be to respect that these technologies are good enough for certain applications and focus on that. Um, many of these technologies like AI, 5G, batteries are available in universities. Now, if you want something nearer to the market, go and talk to A-Star. A-Star is doing a lot more translative uh, R&D. So in terms of the readiness, the university technology is usually at the technology readiness level of about three to four. It will take another two to three years to reach uh, seven or eight. So uh, either you work with them on it or you go to A-Star which has already have many of the technologies translated to that level. And therefore, companies can take over. I wish you luck in all your disruptive uh, technology and innovation opportunity. Thank you very much.